we will just wait for two more minutes. So, this is a recorded, this is a recorded event um, for everybody who has joined. Um, welcome everybody to the first iReceptor Plus seminar of 2022. Um, it's with extreme pleasure um, to welcome today um, two major players in the ARC field. Uh, we have the keynote speaker Thierry Mora from ONS um, in Paris, and he will talk about diversity, dynamics, and specificity of immune repertoires. And then um, afterwards, we have Elisa Rosati from uh, Kiel uh, talking on reverse epitope discovery, which I think is a recent preprint of hers. Um, so really exciting uh, work presented today. So um, the schedule is as follows. Thierry will talk for about 40 minutes and then we have questions and then from 5 p.m we have elisa's talk and we try to and she will talk for 20 minutes and then we try to close at 17 30. you can ask questions via chat or via raising your hand after the talks so yeah this was the outline and um with that i will give the word to thierry thank you very much for being here and very much looking forward to your talk well thank you a lot victor for the invitation I'm very glad to be here uh, and to present uh, our, our work uh, to, to the community. And this talk is going to be a, a bit of an overview of what we've been doing uh, in the past uh, five plus years. And so I start by acknowledging all my collaborators uh, at DNS Paris, uh, in particular Alexandra Valchak, who's my the co PI on all this, of this work, uh, our collaborators in Princeton, as well as in uh, Moscow, uh, as the uh, in the Russian Academy of Sciences. And so, uh, so there's no need to introduce uh, repertoires uh, to this community, uh, but I still focus, you know, you know tell you why I'm interested in them. So what I really find fascinating about repertoires is the diversity. And as we know, this diversity is there to match the diversity of different pathogens that we may encounter. And another thing that I find really interesting is that uh, immune repertoires in principle they carry a, a historical record of past infections uh, through the memory repertoire. And, uh, and, and in that sense, they, they carry a lot of information about the immune status of people. And to me, this, this poses two uh, central questions, which I'm going to try to address uh, broadly in this talk. Uh, the first one is how can we quantify the diversity and characterize the diversity of TCR and PCR repertoires, in, uh, in, including in healthy patients? And the second one is once we have a, a repertoire, so a repertoire usually is a list of, uh, of chronotypes, uh, how can we associate that to, uh, to antigens in particular to, and to disease, right? Because we need to know what BCR and TCRs are involved in the response and are involved in recognizing particular antigens. So these will be the, the two uh, central questions that will guide uh, my presentation. Uh, so let me start with the diversity. So uh, as you know, the, the way the repertoire is formed is a uh, is, is multi-step process. It starts with receptor generation through VG0, VG0 combination. And this is followed by initial selection steps. So in, in the case of, of uh, T cells, this is through semic selection, but something similar happens with B cells. And after that, there's what I call somatic selection, somatic evolution uh, that happens in the periphery. Uh, of uh, and and in uh, and in if nodes and so on, uh, of the of the the the, uh, the lymphocyte clones that can expand or, or die as a function of what happens to them. Right? So let me first focus on the receptor generation part. Uh, how I, is the diversity generated in the first place? So as we know, this is done through a VDJ recombination. So I'm not going to go into the details of the how that goes. I, I'm, I'm assuming that you all know uh, uh, what this process. Uh, it's similar for B and T cells. And there's two chains in each case, uh, heavy and beta in one case, and uh, light and alpha, but it's quite similar. And so what we want to know, uh, what we want to do is basically characterize statistically the, the different uh, probabilities of these things happening, right? And there's an issue we, we're doing this uh, using repertoire data uh, which is the following. So the, the repertoire data will typically uh, be uh, 
presented in this uh, in this kind of format where you have a nucleotide sequence or actually the raw data is just a nucleotide sequence this is already annotated and uh from 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 this you can do annotation so like we, we give you the v d and j and the inserted parts right and and typically what you would like to do is to basically learn the statistics of these different choices and these different events from uh, those annotations and the issue is that these annotations are not necessarily extremely reliable. And here I'm giving an example of an ambiguity in the annotation. So th this is uh, the same sequence here shown in gray, but twice. And what I'm showing is that two different scenarios can actually give rise to the exact same sequence. In this particular example, we can't really know whether it's actually a D1 or D2 that gave rise to the sequence. And, we also, and therefore, we also don't know really what the number of insertions and deletions are. right? And so to, to address this issue, uh, we developed a, a piece of software, which we call Igor, uh, which will take as an input raw nucleotide sequences. And uh, through uh, probabilistic annotations, we'll learn the, the statistical features, I mean, the statistical properties of the VDJ recommendation process. A, a, a key point is that because we're interested in just the generation and not what happens afterwards, uh, for this analysis, we usually focus on non-productive sequences. So these are sequences that have a stop codon in the CDR3 or, or that they, or they have a frame shape, frame shape typically in the CDR3. So that, way, so that we, we really certain that those sequences did not uh, undergo any kind of selection. So they're selection free, it's just a raw output of a generation except for the, for the, for the frame shift. And the way, uh, I mean, I'm not gonna go into the mathematical details, but the way that our strategy, the strategy uh, taken by Igor, is that instead of just taking, of relying on one scenario, VDJ recommendation scenario for each sequence, we're going to sum over all possible scenarios that could have uh, uh, given rise to that particular sequence. And then we use a, a, stat, you know, a statistical learning technique called expect, expectation maximization to actually learn the parameters of the model. And so here, what do I mean by parameters of the model? Uh, and maybe to illustrate this, it's best to actually show the, those parameters once they've been learned on, uh, on, sequen on sequencing data. And this is for TCR beta chain. Uh, it's essentially the probability distribution of the number and composition of insertions here on the top, uh, the distribution of the number of deletions for each gene, and the distribution of V, D, and J usage. And here, what I've shown actually is results uh, where we learned a model for each individual in a cohort of almost 700 people. And the, the, uh, the violin plots here show you the viability uh, across individuals, across those almost 700 individuals. And what you can see from this is that the, the, this process is, is very reproducible from person to person. So it doesn't really depend on the immune history, genetic background, and so on. In particular, uh, the, the part concerning the insertions uh, and deletions is extremely reproducible. So, and that points to really universal biochemistry of the different enzymes that are responsible for the VDJ recombination process. The D VD and J usages, on the other hand, are a bit more viable from individual, individual to individual. And that reflects probably the genetic background uh, that, that, that are different. But still, you know, it's uh, by and large, this is fairly. Uh, uh, conserved across people. Okay, so that's one output of the model to actually get to the biochemistry, if you like, or the, the distribution of different scenario events. But one other output of the procedure is that now that we have a model for any sequence you give me, I can estimate for you the probability that that sequence is generated, right? And that's we, we, this, this, this uh, probability we will call PGen as in a generation probability. Uh, so I, to give you a sense of the orders of magnitude of what that generation probability is, here what I've shown is, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the histogram of this PGen for naturally occurring sequences, and starting here with TCR beta sequences. So we can see at the, at the level of nucleotide, but uh, it's still mostly true at the level of amino acids, uh, the probability of a given uh, TCR beta sequence is typically of the order of 10 to minus 10. 
right? So which is very, very, very low. And it gets even worse because there's also the alpha chain. The alpha chain is a bit less diverse. So the priority of each sequence is a bit higher. But if we talk about the full alpha beta chronotype, the typical sort of probability, even at the amino acid, le amino acid level, is between 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 25 uh, uh, probability. So that really tells you that you know each sequence that you see in repertoire typically uh, are extremely rare and and really uh, particular to that person. Now we we can actually use this in getting ahead of myself. Uh, so so far I've, I've only told you about this generation probability. So now now let's move on to the to the repertoire as we actually see it in the periphery, typically in the blood when, when it's uh, humans. And usually that's not just uh, the result of generation, it's the, also the result of uh, thermic selection for T cells and similar selection for T cells. And so to, to learn something about this, uh, we can now focus on the productive sequences found in the blood. So the second selection stage. And uh, what we did is that we, we, le we learned again a statistical model, but we didn't start from scratch. As a starting point, we started from the generation uh, model that we had before. So the one purely from uh, recombination that we learned from non-productive sequences. And now we're going to say that the priority of seeing a productive sequence in the, in the blood, in the periphery, is just going to be modulated by this uh, selection factor, which we, uh, is, is we call a selection energy here, E. And this selection energy will just be an additive function of the amino acid composition of the CDR3, as well as of the V and J usage. Right? So that, that's, the first, uh, that's the first model that we, we propose. Uh, and the, you know, the, the fact that it's an additive model is motivated by uh, biophysical considerations. But you can actually go beyond that. And instead of just having a simple additive model, you can also uh, replace this by a deep artificial neural network uh, to possibly account for more complex interactions between uh, amino acids. And so, um, once you've, you've done that, so then the, the name of the game is to actually learn the parameters of those models, so the different weights here, uh, from the data of, on productive sequences from the repertoires. And then you can try to see whether the model is actually predicted. Right? And so um, that's what I'm, I'm showing here. Uh, here, what this shows is a comparison between the empirical frequency of particular TCR beta uh, chronotypes in a large cohort of 700 people. So it's actually the same people uh, I was talking about before uh, versus uh, on the y-axis our model prediction. Right? And so this is for simply the additive model on the, on the left and on the right. Uh, we get a, a significant improvement if we use this deep ne neural network uh, model. But I should still point out that the agreement is fairly good. Uh, if you consider that here, it's a, co it's a person correlation coefficient in the logarithm of those probabilities, because those probabilities are extremely small, just taking the raw probabilities is not very useful because these probabilities are, are very, very close to zero, all, all of them. Uh, uh, but when you take the log, that means you also get a lot of spread because of, uh, of sampling errors. And, and yet we get a pretty good uh, agreement. And I, I've shown this for, for TCR beta, and we have similar results for TCR alpha, as well as for BCRs or immunoglobulins. Um, so, okay, so what can we do with this uh, model? So now, I, before I said that we have this p-gen, that's the probability that a particular sequence is generated. And with this p-post, so this p-gen modified by the selection factor, now we have a, a model for the probability of a sequence being found in the blood. So one thing we can do with this, uh, I mean, there's many things we can do with it, but one thing that, that's sort of fun is, is to, to revisit the question of public repertoires. And, uh, and that's the question of how much sharing do you expect between unrelated individuals? And so to address this question, I, I wanna define a, what we call the sharing number. So let me explain this on this uh, mock example here. In this star example, you have three individuals with three different repertoires. And what you, not, what you notice is, uh, and the, the color, the, sorry, the, the chronotypes here are colored 
by in how many different individuals they were seen. So the black ones are purely private, meaning they were only seen in these people. The blue ones, there's four of them, uh, were seen in at least two people. And there's one sequence that was seen in all three, right? So the sharing numbers for would be one, two, and three. And well, to get a sharing spectrum, we can actually plot the histogram of the number of sequences with each sharing number, right? So one, two, and three. And so we, we applied this to our, our same cohort of, uh, of uh, 700 people, and we get a spectrum of the sort. Uh, what we can see here in the y-axis, the sharing number. And here, this is how many TCRs in the data sets had that sharing number, right? And so here on the left end of the spectrum, you have the purely private TCRs that were seen in only one person. And it's actually the majority of sequences, right? Large majority of sequences. And on the other end of the spectrum here on the right, you have sequences that are seen by a majority of people. Of course, there's much fewer of them. Uh, but already you can see from this spectrum that uh, when one talks about public repertoires, one has to be a bit careful about, you know, where do we put the boundary between what we call public and what we call private, right? Because something that was seen by just two people is probably, you know, two out of 700, so you, you, you may say uh, they're mostly private. But another uh, uh, thought that this inspires is that since most sequences are private, uh, that means that the immune repertoire of each person is completely unique to that person and can be used to uniquely identify these people. And so we, 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 we run with this idea to, to do the following sort of uh, fun, following um, thought experiment uh, that involves a, a crime. So imagine that, uh, you know, there's a murder or something and the criminal leaves some blood on the, on the crime scene. Uh, and then you try to look for uh, the, the, the culprit. And so you have a suspect and you're going to take a blood sample from that suspect. And you're going to, instead of doing normal genetic testing, you're going to sequence the repertoires, both in the, in the blood drop and in the sample, right? And so the idea is that if the two uh, samples come from the same person, you should see a lot of overlap in the repertoires and including some private sequences. And the reason for this is because of course, uh, the repertoires are organized in, organized in clones. So each person, each clone is represented by many cells. If on the other hand, it's, the, it's the different people. So if the person, your suspect is actually not the culprit, then you may still see some sharing uh, between the clone types, but this sharing uh, will be due to public sequences. So these sequences that are randomly shared by accident between unrelated individuals. And indeed you can show, uh, you know, doing this kind of in silico experiment, we didn't actually uh, uh, look at, at, uh, at left blood by people. Uh, you can show that uh, doing this analysis, you can easily distinguish samples coming from the same person from uh, samples coming from different people. And uh, of course, the, the, the key interesting point about this is that this still works for, uh, for identical twins, which are shown here by these uh, three uh, green dots. And the reason for this is that even though they have the exact same genetic background, the VDJ recombination is random and it's going to be realized differently in each of those two twins. In that sense, uh, it really works like with fingerprints, meaning that uh, the repertoire actually the, carries not so much information about the genetic background, but it's really unique to each person, including twins. Now, of course, uh, you can go a bit beyond the counting simply the number of shared TCRs by using the, the fact that the ones that are shared by chance should be public. And by public, I mean they should have a high PGM. So instead of, of just counting, we can do a, 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 something slightly more fancy, which is just to weigh our shared sequences with some factor that depends with the expected degree of publicness, which is given by log of one of the, one of the PGM. And if we do this, we get much better, better performance than uh, just counting shared sequences. And in fact, with just uh, as few as 10,000 cells, we can get uh, error rates that are below 10 to the minus nine, so one part in a billion. All right. Okay, so let's go back to, to sharing. So the sharing I've shown so far was for TCR beta, but we can actually do the same sort of analysis uh, on a cohort of uh, healthy patients 
analyzing the uh, antibody repertoire. So in that case, uh, IG, I, we, we did IgM and IgG, and this is uh, IgG. And I should, I should maybe mention that this is not just the raw IgG sequences, these are the inferred naive sequences of those IgG, so uh, after we've removed the hypermutations. And so you can see, again, you get the similar sharing spectrum. It goes much, uh, it doesn't go as far because we only have 10 uh, donors in this case. But again, the, the model, so the people's model learned uh, using the statistical techniques I, I've, uh, I've described, uh, can predict this sharing spectrum fairly well, right? But now things get, get interesting. If instead of taking a cohort of healthy individuals, you take a cohort of people who ha all have the same condition. And in, the, in this particular example, we, we took data from various papers that appeared in the last couple of years of uh, repertoires, IgG uh, repertoires of, uh, of patients who were uh, having COVID at the time, who were tested positive, so SARS-CoV-2. And in that case, uh, you get a very different picture. Uh, you still get the spectrum of sharing, but now you can see that the model is actually very bad and completely underestimates the amount of sharing. And that's not really surprising. That's sort of what we expect. If you expect convergent selection of uh, antibodies that target the same antigen targets, the same uh, antigens in SARS-CoV-2. And so that's our, our hypothesis that this oversharing is a signature of this conversion selection. But then what this also implies is that we can use this to detect uh, and to find uh, the sequences of antibodies that are specific uh, to COVID or that are associated to, the, to, to COVID-19. And so the way we do this is that we, we, we plot uh, in a similar way as, as I showed before for so TCRs, uh, our model prediction on the uh, y-axis versus the, the empirical frequency or the empirical sharing number in uh, our small cohort. And we select out uh, sequences here shown in red that have a high sharing number, so they are really highly shared between people, and yet have a low probability of having been seen in those people in the first place. So those guys um, basically are the, the outliers, the, the ones that don't agree with the model. They're shared despite the fact that they were not very likely in the first place. Right, and so uh, in, in the in the COVID nineteen cohort, and so this gives us a way to to have a list of candidate chronotypes that are associated to COVID nineteen, and then one can uh, examine those chronotypes, and for instance, one can see that they organize in clusters. So these are uh, these are graph representations show uh, one chronotype is one node, and we put a link if the, the two chronotypes are similar by in sequence. And the color uh, corresponds to specificity, which was checked uh, by running against databases. And you can see uh, a consistent picture of uh, specificity clusters for different parts of SARS-CoV-2, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Something else that you can do is uh, use this for uh, diagnostics. So you, you can essentially look, in, you know, once you have the repertoire of, of somebody, you can uh, essentially count how many of those uh, COVID-associated sequences they have. And we do a bit more than counting. We, we, we devise a log-likelihood ratio score. And uh, in doing this, uh, perfectly separates patients who have uh, COVID here uh, on, the, on the right, those who have a positive score in green, from uh, the, the negative sample. So people who didn't have COVID uh, that we know they don't have COVID because the, the samples were taken in 2019. So in a way, like you can think of this as a as a the repertoire equivalent of a serological test, where right? you're really looking for for uh, the presence of antibodies that you've shown were associated to, to COVID, and and this presence is enough to actually detect whether the person has COVID or not. All right. Um, so, so that's one way to look for, for disease-specific uh, uh, chronotypes. And I said in the beginning of the talk, that was one of the, of, of the questions that we, we, you know, we found interesting is to look for the part of the repertoire that's specific to a given disease, that's specific for a given antigen. But there's another way, uh, which I'm going to present now. I'm going to switch gear a little bit, but 
which is to use uh, long longitudinal data. Uh, and so uh, it's something we, we started actually uh, looking at uh, vaccination, but uh, I'm going to present more recent data in the context uh, of, uh, of COVID. Uh, so we had data from two people. So this, this is from our collaborators in Moscow uh, who got infected by COVID and uh, whose repertoire was sampled at different time points following the infection. So in this case, we didn't have early time points because uh, these people were quarantined. Uh, but, so we get time points from day 15. And uh, then from the repertoires of all uh, at those old time points, one can then, uh, so you know, at each time point, you get, as I showed before, a list of chronotypes with their frequencies. And since we have different time points, we can now plot those frequencies as a function of time, right? And so if I plot the row trajectories, and so, uh, uh, as a function of time. So here, each trajectory corresponds to one uh, TCR beta sequence, for instance. You see it's a bit of a mess. It's hard to, to make sense out of it. So what we did, the first thing we do is to do a principal component analysis of the trajectories, right? And uh, we, we, we find the following structure with three clear uh, clusters. Uh, this big purple cluster here corresponds to sequences that didn't really change in abundance. So these are, you know, uh, TCRs that are not really involved in the COVID response. And then we have two other interesting clusters. The green one first, um, corresponds actually to contraction from day 15 on, probably corresponds to a peak that was prior to day 15, and then uh, went back down, right? And then in, in yellow, we have a second uh, response uh, that peaks at day 37 in our case, and uh, that, that response, we actually don't really understand. We think that the first response is the one that's uh, really associated to, to COVID, or at least associated to SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to focus on this one. Uh, so to actually look for the chronotypes that are involved in this, uh, in this uh, first response, this contraction, we're going to look for chronotypes that have had a significant contraction from day 15 to day 45. And if you do a scatter plot of the frequency of, all, of each chronotype uh, at these two uh, time points, uh, you see something like this. So the guys that you're interested in are the guys in red, and the guys that are actually higher at day 15 than at day 45, those are the contracting ones. But um, well, I'm, going, no, I'm not going to go into the details, but we, we worked out a way to decide where this, uh, the separating line between the significantly contracted clones uh, and the others are is based on the on noise model because as you as you know if you take two repertoire uh, if you do two repertoire sequencing experiments on the same day on the same person uh, you will see a lot of noise and so you need to account for that to to distinguish that from real contraction okay but uh, you know, once you've done that though you have a list of candidate covid associated chronotypes here in red and then you can start analyzing them so you know, one, one first observation one can make is that uh, these uh, chronotypes, they actually found uh, to be stable post-infection in the memory pool. And in this particular case, for this particular donor, we also found that uh, some of those chronotypes were present prior to the infection, because it, it, I didn't show it here, but we actually had uh, uh, samples from those uh, individuals from before the pandemic, just by chance. So we could look back and see whether those contracted clones were present before, and they were, and not only they were present, but they were also present in the memory pool. So that suggests that there was some pre-existing specificity uh, to uh, SARS-CoV-2 in these people. And the, uh, I'll come back to that in, in about 30 seconds. Uh, the, the, the next thing one can do by analyzing those chronotypes is uh, to, to examine them uh, using this sort of uh, network uh, view I was already showing for, for, for antibodies. So here again, uh, each node is a, is a TCR beta sequence. And we put a link between them if they differ by less than two amino acids in this CDR3. And you, you can see that uh, these uh, sequences form clusters. And we could actually uh, infer the, specific, the specificity of those clusters based on uh, databases and also on tetramer assays. Uh, 
Uh, and so we could identify three, a uh, particular antigen of SARS-CoV-2, uh, two in the S protein and one in RF7B. And the, this one here in pink is particularly interesting because this antigen is actually homolog with, you know, with one amino acid uh, difference to uh, an antigen of, uh, of uh, human coronavirus uh, uh, causing the common cold. And the TCR specific for that antigen were, they, were the, they are the ones that were present prior to the infection in that particular donor. So the, what this suggests is that the reason why that donor had pre-existing uh, TCR specific to SARS-CoV-2 is because uh, that person got infected by the, the, the common cold coronavirus uh, earlier. And thanks to cross-reactivity, it had some of those uh, uh, pre-existing pre TCRs. Now, I mean, I should point out that did, that did not prevent, of course, that person from getting sick. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so what, what this, uh, also with this network uh, view uh, and this clustering of, of sequences suggests is that we could maybe actually use these network um, properties to, to identify antigen specific sequences just from a single snapshot from a single from repertoire taken at a single time point. And the idea is the following is that if we uh, stimulate a repertoire with an antigen, uh, what we've seen in the previous slide suggests that all the TCRs that uh, uh, expand specifically in response to this antigen will form these uh, closely knit clusters. Right? Maybe they, they won't be uh, just a single one, maybe several, but you expect this kind of clustering of the antigen specific uh, chronotypes. And so that that's, uh, led us to devise an algorithm that looks for uh, chronotypes that have a lot of neighbors, or at least more neighbors than would be expected by a, a norm model. And in that case, the norm model we use, of, of course, is our, our PGEN model that I introduced in the first part. And, and that way you can actually uh, get some, uh, some hits. Uh, the algorithm is called Alice and we call those Alice hits. And these Alice hits are uh, pres you know, pr presumed candidates for specificity uh, to the disease that uh, affected that person when we took the repertoire of that, of that done. And so we, uh, I'm not going to show you uh, data for SARS-CoV-2 uh, but instead to uh, about the previous study we did uh, by vaccination with yellow, the yellow fever vaccine, which is a, a, a model for an acute infectious uh, uh, immune response. And uh, what we find is that, so in, in that case, we, we, had a, we also had a day zero. So because of course it was vaccination, it was a, a control experiment. So the repertoire was taken exactly at day zero. So right before the, the vaccination. And uh, what we can see is that we see a lot more hits at day 15, so the presumed peak of the infection, than at day zero, except for one, uh, one patient who uh, actually uh, had another infection at day zero, so the day he got vaccinated. And uh, we can further show that uh, more than about half of those Alice hits actually validated, uh, were actually validated to be a specific specific to the yellow fever vaccine. So that means that uh, the method is actually specific and uh, can actually detect um, sequences involved in the immune uh, response just from a single snapshot. Okay, so, uh, so I've just shown you how one can use uh, longitudinal data to detect um, disease-specific chronotypes. But now I wanna show you a different way one can use longitudinal data to study repertoires. And it's really in this case to, to study the, the natural long-term dynamics of, uh, of normal repertoires. Um, and so of course, that doesn't mean that these people didn't get any infection because you know, of course we always subject to different, uh, to, to, to different immune stimulations uh, during our lifetime. But you know, it, it's, there's nothing, nothing in particular happened to those people. So we, we collected data from the various studies uh, that we found where such data was possible, because usually people collect data in the context of disease, of course. So these are just healthy people and two repertoire time points were taken uh, over the span of one or two years. And we also had alpha beta chains, different kind of technologies, different labs. 
And uh, the idea is to see how does the, to ask how does the, the repertoire change over these uh, long time scales. And to give you a, a sense of, uh, of, of the magnitude of those changes, you see they're quite subtle. Uh, here I'm showing in, in red, uh, in the scatter plot on the right, uh, a scatter plot of the, the frequency uh, between the two time points that are one year apart, right? And you can see this is highly distinguishable from the control experiment where you take two replicates uh, at the same time point. But it's still a bit different, you, but you can see it's a, it, the most chronotype frequencies de decreased a little bit, and also the spread is a bit uh, larger. So we'd like to, to model and quantify this. And, and to do this, we, we, we're going to start with the, with the model. Uh, it's a model we introduced uh, uh, something like five years ago uh, from mostly theoretical considerations, and it's the following. It's the idea that uh, each clone, each TCR or BCR clone, uh, has an abundance that would, that would vary according to uh, the, the following equation, which reflects the, the, the cell proliferation and death. Okay, so that, that's the simple idea. Um, and the idea is that this, this cell division and death uh, induces a, a net growth of decay rate, which is made of two parts. One, which is kind of, which is a, a, a constant. That's so, sort of the average uh, decay rate. And it's a decay, decay rate and not a growth rate because on average, all chronotypes have to decay. Otherwise they will uh, invade the entire population and the immune repertoire will become, you know, uh, will explode. Uh, and then there's a there's a noise part, and the noise part I call it noise, but it's not really noise. It's it's really the random stochastic simulation stimulation of the repertoire by antigens, and so uh, of the repertoire I should say of that particular chronotype. Uh, so this this uh, green this uh, green uh, term here, the noise, uh, reflects these random uh, stimulations. And so in this model, we just have two parameters, which are actually take the form of time scales. Uh, so one is the time scale of the average decay of all chronotypes, it's called, I call it tau. And the other one is the typical time scale over which uh, chronotypes randomly stochastically grow and, uh, and decay. Uh, and so one thing that we, we found uh, back in 2016 is that, and it was actually the motivation for this sort of model, is that one can solve uh, this sort of model mathematically, and in particular, one can show that the, the, the steady state distribution of clone sizes that results from this sort of model is uh, predicted to be a power law. Uh, and with a particular exponent that's just given by the ratio of the two time, time parameters I introduced. Okay. And indeed, uh, in our data, so the, 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 the data I just talked about in the previous slide, but of course, this observation was made, uh, including by other people, uh, for, for many years. Uh, most repertoires, if you look at the clone size distribution, have this power law structure. And very often, the exponent is actually pretty close to 1. right? And this is no exception. So what we did here is that we looked at the, our longitudinal data, and we learned directly the dynamical parameters uh, theta and tau from the dynamics. Right? And so this is where, where we obtain. Here, this summarizes our results uh, by showing uh, one over tau versus one over theta. And you see that different individuals fall in different places. So there's really uh, this clearly individual variability. But one thing that we, we were pretty happy about is that uh, all those points fall on the, th the, the, the theory prediction, which is that the ratio of these two parameters uh, should agree with the exponent of the power law, which is very close to one. Now, you can still see that uh, there are some uh, individual differences. And what, so the, then the next question is, what drives those, those differences? And uh, you know, maybe a, our first preliminary answer, we don't have that many individuals, but is that it's probably H. Because if we plot uh, this, uh, this, this typical uh, time scale. So this time scale tells you over what uh, uh, what sort of tip characteristic time uh, the repertoire changes and turns over, and you can see that this time increases very rapidly uh, with age. 
uh, of course, it, uh, yeah, this is the, the yeah. So this is the turnover. You can view this tau as a, some sort of a turnover rate. It's very low for young people. So we have a very dynamic repertoire. And as people grow older, the repertoire uh, starts uh, slowing down and gets almost to a standstill. All right, so uh, my time is almost up. So I think it's time to conclude. Um, so what I've presented to you, like, uh, like maybe you can be summarizing three main points. So the, the first part was really about trying to quantify and, uh, and model the, the generation of diversity. So we, I, I, I won't, I mean, maybe the, the main take home message is that this, this process seems to be pretty much universal, it's predictive, and we can predict sharing with it. Uh, then we, we, I talked about how we can infer sequence specificity from various techniques, but either by looking at this oversharing or by looking at the longitudinal data by looking for expanding or contracting clones, or even by looking at single repertoire snapshots using the network analysis. And uh, finally, in the last five minutes, I, I told you about uh, one can learn uh, the parameters of uh, natural repertoire dynamics from healthy patients. And uh, I've shown that um, these dynamics seem to slow down uh, with age. And uh, yeah, with that, uh, I'll stop and I'm happy to, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much for this beautiful talk, Thierry. Um, so I think we will start with the questions that are in the chat. Yes, okay. So we had uh, one very early on and that was from Maria and she asked, um, it was one um, about the PGN distribution of the alpha beta pairing. So she asks, um, when you calculate the probability of alpha beta uh, pair uh, PGNs, do you assume that alpha beta chains are independent? Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Yes, for this particular plot, we assume they're independent. But uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but we actually investigated this because we, we studied uh, repertoire data set where we had uh, paired uh, alpha beta uh, information. And we find that by and large, they're really almost independent. I mean, there are some small correlations and we can quantify them, but um, that, that will actually not change very much those plots. I hope that answers the question. And is there, um, this is my own question now, is there yes. um, a biochemical reason for that? So do we understand this um, structurally also or? Yeah. So I, this, this, I mean, there's two answers to this. I, I mean, the first thing is that alpha and beta, of course, the recombination processes happen largely independently mm -hmm. right, on different chromosomes. So that's the first thing. And in fact, in all, our, in all our experience, the main driver of diversity is really the recombination, not so mm -hmm. much. Okay. So then what could change, what could introduce correlations between alpha and beta is, of course, selection, either semi selection or uh, somatic selection. Mm. And that I, I don't have a very good answer for it because I would have expected that because you want alpha and beta to make a, a valid, you know, you want them to be compatible in a way, right? So there should be some compatibility rules, mm. but that doesn't really seem to be the case. Mm. And maybe the reason for this is evolutionary, which is that if, if it was too stringent about how what you could pair with what, then you would lose a lot of cells. Mm. But that's just my yeah. And uh, one more for, quick follow up. So, do you, is this also? Did you also do the same for the HVL? So for immunoglobulins yes. also? Yeah. Yeah, and it, the story is very similar. Very similar. Okay. So then we have the second question from Hui Wan, who asks for the imprint story. Um, did you see the TCR BCR repertoire sample from the same person at different times? Uh, in brackets, months, years, how many TCR BCRs are the same? Well, yeah, okay. Again, <laughs> very astute question. Uh, yes, I mean, we did. And in fact, that was one of the motivation, I should have said it, uh, for the last part of the talk where we talked about this, the, how the repertoire evolves. Uh, because what this, what this underpins is that if the repertoire turns over too quickly, then this imprint uh, you know, immune footprint won't, won't be very stable either. And so we, we find that because, so maybe like the answer is, uh, in a way the answer is, uh, is, in, is in the last slide, right? Mm. Uh, 
like if you see that the the repertoire turns over turns over on the order of years, that means that imprints will also be uh, stable over years. And so, so in the in the in the in the paper that we wrote about imprint, we actually uh, discuss this and we show how this imprint is is expected to be is predicted to be stable over years. Of course, since we only have samples that are at most uh, three years apart right now. Uh, we can't really push it to, to very long times. Um, but yeah, so the, this is why we need models to somewhat uh, try to extrapolate to longer times. Great. I hope again that answers the question. Um, then we have a question from Paul. How did you assign a specificity to a cluster? And did you find multiple specificities in one cluster? Did you clean the database based on the confidence threshold of specificity? Uh, so, uh, Paul, can, can can you specify whether you're talking? So, so the question came at forty-two. So, you, I'm guessing you're talking about the SARS-CoV-2 uh, TCR specificity. Uh, let me try and go back to. He says yes. Yeah. This one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, right. So the way we guess the specificity is uh, in two ways. So one is marked in T is that there was actually a tetramer experiment that was performed on that particular uh, donor uh, in, in which they, they, they identified uh, TCRs that were specific to that particular uh, peptide, okay? And for the other ones, that's by cross uh, checking against the uh, something called the mirror assay that was a, an assay that was done by adaptive biotech and that was made that was published online uh, in which they they published a list of sequences along with the with antigenic regions that they were associated with and so this is how we we identify the, the specificity is that good enough for you sounds good if not, Paul can follow up. So then there is another um, question from Alexandra and uh, she asks, does the publicity of the repertoire um, sequences depend on the MHC, MHC genotype? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. And, and the answer of course is yes, uh, but it, it's, it's pretty hard to, so it's true like we, we, we've been a bit agnostic about MHC in this story. And, uh, and, and, you know, we wanted to see how much we can push it by ignoring MHC information, right? But like, you can do much better if you actually include MHC, uh, well, HLA actually uh, uh, types. Uh, but the difficulty with this is that, so we, we tried pretty hard to learn how the different models uh, depend on HLA type. And it's, it's very hard to see clear associations. I mean, there are some things that, that, that come up and you know that were known before some vj combinations are associated to some MHCs. but i think that the, the difficulty lies in the fact that hla types are very diverse and so it's not so easy to 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 do but it's you know it, it's a good point and i think maybe that's something that one should do at some point like for instance look at hla a02 and study the sharing in just people with just that yeah uh, but it was a limitation that since you know if, if you, especially if you look at bulk repertoire, you still have 12 HLA types. Uh, you know, you still have 12 HLA. So even though you know that H, HLA is 0, 02, uh, only one, I mean, potentially one twelfth of your repertoire is actually uh, concerned by that. So, you know, you get something maybe a bit more shared, or, but, you know, by one twelfth. So, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. That makes sense. I agree. I agree. So then there is a long question from Valerie. So probably it's better if you read it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so the question, slide. question regarding slide three, mm. when you've been talking about gene distribution and site containing condition distribution. Uh, so let me go to this. Let me go to the slide in question. So, so it's about TCR beta and uh, in our generation model, we um. we assume. And, I mean, we, we've shown uh, empirically that V was essentially independent of D and J, but D and J were dependent of each other. And uh, 
so did you the, the question is did you estimate the probabilities of amino acid sequences as such or did you rather map the sequences onto some embedding space and then estimate the chain distribution in the embedding space? Um, so, uh, so first of all, I should say this, this is not amino acid distribution. I mean, this is not amino acid that we're talking about here. It's, it's purely nucleotide sequences. And- uh, oh, Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and we didn't embed into any space. Like we, we just record, uh, those frequencies, right? Directly from the from the from our probabilistic annotations. Thank you. Great. Are there any further questions? If oh, not, then... I, I, oh, yeah, Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, it was, it was really thought provoking talk. Um, I was just wondering, and people talk about public and private clonotypes, and I was really interested in your oversharing. And I was just wondering, uh, would it be possible to look at some published data and you know where they haven't, of course, included oversharing or the PGen? And you know, do you get you know do you get radically different predictions if you introduce the PGen? If I understand, you know, the PGen distribution or. Uh I'm, I'm not sure I understand. The well, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at, I'm just thinking, um, you know, when you when you tried to classify some as overshared or not overshared, yeah. um, oh, uh, um, you include that original PGen to, I think that's what means overshare, right? I mean, right, okay. you get radically different or, you know, yeah. Yeah, so, okay, let me, okay, <laughs> let me try something then. Yeah, me, okay. Right. So, the idea of a sharing was already used uh, by uh, Harlan Robbins group where they used, uh, so th what they were after actually is they, they had a cohort of uh, CMV positive and CMV negative people. And so they looked at the sharing in the CMV positive people, and then they compared to a control cohort, which was the CMV negative one. So, but, so then they have a notion of oversharing, which oh, is, oh. Mm -hmm. You share more in the CMV positive cohort mm -hmm. than you would expect from the CMV negative cohort. Okay. So what we do instead is that instead of relying on, on the negative control cohort, which is hard and you know, it's, it's, you have a lot of sampling noise and so on, we used our, our model. So we use the model to, to replace the negative control in a way, right? Does that make sense? So instead of asking, do you see more sharing in the CMV positive than, or in the COVID positive or whatever positive. Then in a control cohort, we ask, do you see more sharing in, uh, mm -hmm. in our cohorts of interest uh, relative to what we would have expected from the model? Uh, using the model allows us to get a much better uh, estimate on the second part. In, in particular for, because many sequences I, as I've shown have probability of 10 to minus 10. Uh, that will never see, be seen actually in the in the. Mm. Oh, okay. In the well, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm kind of looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then also, I have more a general question, and um, I usually ask this people uh, this to people that um, talk about you know genetics, and so you, we we have these bias distribution, right? Some B genes are more used than others. Some insertions and deletions are more observed than, than others and so on. And, uh, and uh, probably this is an evolutionary reason for that. And maybe it's, so what do you think is the reasons of why we see some regions, why some regions are more used than others and uh, why do we see these um, generation models and not yeah. other generation models? Yeah. Do you think they are, they are optimal versus the environment that we have to recognize or, yeah. It's a Fascinating question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say like the, you know, the one that I highlight, highlighted in right here. Yeah. You know, some of those I think are somewhat constrained by biochemistry. So for instance, <laughs> and therefore I, they may not have an evolutionary meaning. So for instance, if you look at the tail of the number of insertions, mm. right, if you put it in semi-log plot, it's almost a perfect exponential decay. Mm. 
So that suggests like some, you know, some some enzyme coming off randomly. It's like it's I see. Uh, yes. Uh, the mm. matrix distribution. Mm. And so now it is true that it has a peak at five or four, right? And if you look at mouse, it has a peak at two. Mm. And maybe there's a reason for that. Because maybe mm. mice doesn't need as as diverse a repertoire because it has fewer cells. Mm. Uh, so that would point towards what you're saying, like maybe this is optimizing mm. You could make the same argument for, you see there's ATGC uh, probabilities in the insertions are not random. And you know, why is that? Mm. Uh, now for, for VDJ, I think, you know, you probably know this better than me. I actually have no intuition for why, you know, we don't have uniform distributions. And, and even like, I, I think it goes further than that. I don't really understand what's the, the evolutionary constraint on, on how conserved the V, D, and J are. Right. Yeah. That yeah. I, I really have no idea. Why, why do you have that many genes? I mean, some loci, you have 86 genes, and some other, you have 128. And why is that? I, I have no idea. And, and why does it differ across species and so on? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, because, I, you know, if you, I don't know if somebody tried that experiment, but if you try to reduce the number of V and J genes in mouse and see whether they still live. Would love to do this experiment. Yes. Yes, I, I I think people have shown all the sorts of stuff. Like for instance, removing removing TDT, the mice still live and are fine, right? Uh, so without insertion, so they, they seems to be robust to a lot of stuff. So that that's that's that is the question of why is it the way it is? Yeah, yeah. And are there other optimal? Um, could there be other optimal German yeah. distributions? Right? Yeah, yeah. No, but I I love that question. I mean, yeah. I, I feel, yeah. otherwise we also work a lot on. Ideas of optimization in uh, in the mm -hmm. immune system, or to think of the immune system as having been optimized over yeah. every time scales. So mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah, yeah, super fascinating. Yeah. yeah.